I have spent the last 15 years thinking and writing about Venezuela and its Bolivarian revolution ever since I first met Hugo Chavez in his first year in power. He was the most amazing man. Such fun to be with. So amusing. So talkative. So generally optimistic. Just a lovely man. And when he died a few weeks ago, like all of you, I'm sure, I was completely devastated. And when I went to Caracas ten days ago for the election of Nicolas Maduro, you had this extraordinary sense of a, an absence, somebody who should have been there. Somebody who should have been there but wasn't there. So I thought I would start by talking about the tomb of Chavez. I don't think anybody here today has talked about that, but I went to see it on election day. And it was a most extraordinary experience. The tomb has been constructed within a wonderful sort of, it's like a toy castle. A castle built a hundred years ago by Cipriano Castro in 1906. And it's called the Quartel de la Montaña, the barracks of the mountain. And it is on a very high hill looking over the whole of Caracas. It's a most extraordinary site. I've never been there before. I don't quite know why. And it's in the... Um, the Barrio 23 de Enero, which those of you who've been to Caracas will know, is a big working class suburb that has been there uh, certainly since the 50s. And the importance of, of the Cuartel de la Montaña is that in 1992, Chavez used this barracks as his headquarters when he was organizing the coup that he hoped would overthrow Carlos Andres Pérez. The coup failed, but the memory of Chavez in this barracks has always remained, and I think for that reason it was chosen uh, to house uh, Chavez's tomb. It has also been used for many years as the historical museum of the armed forces. And again, I think it was suitable because among Chavez's many characteristics was his capacity to be a historian. He was a passionately interested in in, in, in Venezuelan history and in Latin American history. Uh, and I think it, it is part of his charm that he introduced into Venezuela, or reintroduced, the idea of a national narrative. And I think he succeeded in uh, persuading the people of Venezuela that they were engaged on an epic journey. And he was saying, join me in this rediscovery of our history. Because I cannot tell you, before Chavez came to power, Venezuela was such an Americanized country. To visit Caracas was like to go to Atlanta, or some miserable city of the South in the United States. <laughs> and very, very little charm of its own. You could go out into the countryside, you could go to Merida, you can go to the Orinoco and feel that you were or the Llanos, feel that you were in Venezuela proper. But in Caracas in particular, it was a horrible uh, Americanized city. And Chavez reversed that process and gave Venezuelans pride in who they were. Now, the, the tomb of Chavez is in a very beautifully designed little courtyard in, in, on the edge of this, um, of this quartel, of this barrack. And Chavez himself, is, the, the coffin is contained in a vast, vast um, marble, uh, about twice the size of this tape, a huge, huge, great thing. Very, very impressive, very well done, with inscriptions on the side, and 
based on water, so that you, you, you view it, you can walk around it uh, as though it was uh, an island in the middle of water. And then around, around, the, around the, this construction of the tomb are the statues of, of Chavez's favorite heroes. Simon Bolivar, obviously, at the back. Um, Simon Rodriguez to the right, the bus, with this great educator of the early 19th century. And Ezequiel Zamora, uh, the great peasant leader of the mid 19th century, again, one of Chavez's. Uh, great recreations, as it were, of the history of, 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 of Venezuela. And then on either side of, 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 of the tomb are four soldiers on either side in red uniforms with gold braid. And they are, this was the uniform of the Battle of Carabobo in 1821. Uh, again, one of uh, Bolivar's great victories that uh, Chavez would often, often cite. And then outside, outside the castle, where, where, where the view is over the, the whole of Caracas, there is a very small little 19th century cannon. And in a totally created tradition, uh, the soldiers every day at 4.25 in the afternoon, the moment that Chavez died, they fire a, uh, um, what do you fire? Signal. They, they, they shoot half a dozen. Uh, uh, it, it, it's a very, very, very moving moment. Now, the thing about Chavez is that he died extraordinarily. Really, he died at the height of his powers. During his period in office, he had never put a foot wrong. You cannot say Chavez made a big error there, or he really you know, shouldn't have done that. He was absolutely on top of his game throughout. And then suddenly, he's no longer there. And I think his, the fact that he's so unusual makes him so fascinating. And we were discussing with various friends in Caracas whether anybody could think of anybody comparable. And the only person I could come up with was Ataturk, the leader of the once was the Turkish Empire, who turned Turkey into a modern state. And Ataturk was a famous man in his time, and he died in 1938 after a very short illness uh, at the same age as Chavez. I think he, Chavez was 58, Ataturk was 57. So he, he was taken away prematurely by illness. And yet, one has to remember that the legacy of Ataturk is still with us today. Uh, it's only now, only now is it being disintegrating and, uh, and Turkey is obviously moving into a new era. So I think we can say that Chavez, the legacy of Chavez, is safe for at least a hundred years. <laughs> Now, quite often at these gatherings, we have a brief moment where we complain about Rory Cowell. <laughs> <laughs> My successor, after some years, as correspondent in Latin America, and we have to say he is a completely appalling correspondent who was in Caracas for six years, from 2006 to 2012 misinforming us about what was going on. And fortunately, I can relate, he has now moved on to report from Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Although he has left us with a book on Chavez yeah. called Commandante that I cannot yet bring myself to even look at. <laughs> now, individual foreign journalists in Caracas, of course, have been guilty of idleness, ignorance, and bad faith. No doubt about that. Living cheek by jowl with the opposition population in the, op in the upper class zones of the city, they have found it difficult not to share the views and prejudices of their neighbors. Yet the poor performance of individual journalists 
does not altogether explain why the bad mouthing of Chavez has been so prevalent throughout the Western world, in Europe and the United States, as well as in Britain. Le Monde and El País, Liberation and El Mundo have been just as critical as the reporters from The Guardian and The New York Times, with, of course, the exception of Comrade Seamus here. So we have to ask ourselves why Chavez has had such a bad press. Part of the problem, I think, lies with the long surviving caricatures of Latin America that exist in popular memory that have little re relevance to the continent today. There is a long history of military dictators with large, dark glasses, <coughs> going back at least as far as the era of General Pinochet in Chile and of General Galtieri in Argentina. The military tradition of those years meant imprisonment and torture and dropping prisoners out of aeroplanes into the sea. Yet in such a context, how is it that Colonel Chavez, a paratrooper in a red beret, turned out to be such a progressive military man? Mostly ignored by journalists is the fact that Chavez embodied two vibrant traditions from Latin America in the 1960s. First, the unusual experience of government by left-wing officers, notably by General Velasco Alvarado of Peru and by General Omar Torrijos in Panama. Chavez was no Pinochet, and he reconstructed the Venezuelan armed forces to serve the people. The second tradition important to Chavez was the memory of the left-wing guerrilla movements of the 1960s, inspired by Che Guevara and the Cuban Revolution, and of course by Castro. Chavez also embraced the powerful and long-lasting current of left-wing nationalism within Latin America's leftist parties. This was often repressed violently during the years of the Cold War, yet it never remained far from the surface. Another problem is that Chavez's reinvention of socialism, as well as his close affection for Fidel Castro, seems old-fashioned nowadays to many people. Most of us here today can appreciate Fidel for what he is, an historic and popular leader in Latin America who has constructed a great bulwark against the United States. Yet for many social democrats, he is still perceived as a relic of the Cold War. Chavez's friendship with Fidel, in their view, reflects badly on the Venezuelan leader, as did his support for anti-American leaders like Ahmadinejad in Iran, or the man from Belarus. Many academic observers who had hoped for a smooth transition to Western democratic patterns in Latin America after the downfall of the dictators, have also been disappointed by the Venezuelan experience, so different from what they had expected or hoped for more than 10 or 15 years ago. Chavez was disliked by most left of center politicians and many intellectuals in Europe who remained enthralled to the social democratic ideology common in the 1990s. His appeal for something new and different to be summed up, summed up in Latin America was largely ignored. Yet what we can now recognize is that Chavez was a genuine socialist leader. He may not have got very far in his ambition to construct socialism, but he was never in any doubt about his eventual destination. And that is why he chose Maduro.